So uh, thank you so much, uh, Noshad Bhai, uh, BCS. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, more pleasure to be sharing this uh, dais with uh, uh, my very dear friend, Ajay. Uh, Ajay and I are you know, very often seen together on some of the TV shows and uh, we contribute um, to some of the thought processes uh, that we have. Uh, talking about today's uh, topic, which is the inflation and how the dynamics between India and US are different and how we should look at ourselves compared to where the US is. Uh, let's look at first how the US uh, is constituted and what is it that the US government does and how the world is beginning to follow that. If I was to put it in perspective, let's look at the, the two types of uh, inflation that we have. One is the demand push and the other is the cost push. Uh, demand push, obviously there is a lot of demand and the supply is less. So to kill the demand, you raise the interest rates and because of that, the cost of consumption goes up and the affordability comes down and therefore over a period of time, the demand and supply kind of equate out. But when it is cost push, which is the present day scenario, uh, things need to be taken a little differently. The second part of such a cost push uh, inflation that one must consider is the demand elasticity. That is whether the demand would remain static, uh, you know, remain at the present level, even if the price was to increase. Generally, you say that if the price goes up, the demand comes down, which means it's elastic. But if the demand is inelastic, then whatever happens to the price, the commodity price in question, the demand would remain the same. So we need to look at whether it is demand push, cost push, what is the elasticity of demand that we're looking, talking about? Now, in terms of the US, we've always seen that the theory is you raise the interest rates, kill the demand, and definitely the inflation comes into control. It's been observed for so many decades and it has always worked in the US. Why does it work in the US? So this is where I think India really needs to look at the second degree data of the US. The first thing, if you look at the US population, 17 crore, approximately 17 crore, which is 50% of the population is indebted, which is either personal loans, housing loans, education loans or credit card loans. So at any point in time, the sensitivity of the US population to interest rate is very, very high. The, the cost of in interest bearing on any of these loans is directly impacting the disposable income of the Americans. And this is where India is different. In India, the total number of borrowers, this is a broad guess, uh, you know, if we were to look at the RBI data, the NBFC data, and the MFIs, uh, it's approximately about 32, 33 crores out of 130 crores, right? So it's not even one third, whereas in US, we are talking about at least 50% of the population, or probably more, which is indebted. So this is where the impact on the disposable income, US versus India, that's one factor. US, you raise the interest rate, you've actually reduced effectively, very effectively, the disposable income in the hands of the people, they would tend to consume less. So that's one part. The second part is where, what happens to the currency? Obviously, whenever we have seen the US raise the interest rates, you see a flow from emerging markets to the US, especially in their, the debt side, which is the US treasury. Two things, again, uh, Yes, definitely the flow would happen into the US because now you are able to earn on a AAA security, a higher interest rate. But at the same time, as a debt fund manager, would I want to invest in a security, which I know may be a higher interest rate, but it's ultimately gonna give me a mark to market loss over the next, whatever the cycle is remaining. So say for example, in March or April of 2022, if a fund manager had moved money from India into the US and invested in US 10 year security, maybe he was getting about 2.7 or 3%. And today the yield has gone up, which means that he is having a mark to market loss of a few percentage points. 
So would an investment manager do actually something like this? Yes, they do do it. One of the reasons for that is the currency appreciation. So on one side, you have a mark to market loss, but at the same time, the US dollar tends to appreciate across the currencies which we have seen. And that kind of adds up to make the loss which you have done on the debt security. Overall, a huge inflow into the US goes in and that helps them support the fiscal part of it. But this time is very different, very, very different. Up to 2014-15, US used to simply import oil. There was not much of production in US. Today, US exports about 600,000 barrels per day. To give a sense as to where it stands, India imports about 500,000 barrels a day. So US is actually exporting, not importing, exporting 20% more than India's total import on a daily basis. Now, whenever the dollar appreciates and the oil appreciates, US makes double the money, which supports US revenues, which again, in turn, helps them dole out money and support the individuals whether it is for electricity or whatever. So this time is very, very different. I'm making this point because historically it is understood that oil and US dollar have inverse relationship. If US dollar appreciates, the oil comes down. Not this time. And US is actually making more money because the dollar is appreciating and so is the oil. So here is a double benefit to US economy when it comes to the interest rate increase, the dollar appreciation, and the oil price going up. This is the, this is the situation with the US. Now let's look at India. In India, you are completely having an inelastic demand when it comes to oil. You just don't have a choice. The price goes to 120, 130. We are not going to start consuming less immediately. It will take us years to replace the demand for oil or reduce the demand for oil. So here is one part, which is an inelastic demand for oil. The second part is the oil price goes up. We have to incur more and that results into dollar outflows. So that's the second part, our expenditure goes up. So therefore the cost of import goes up and inflation goes up. Now add to it, the fuel to the fire is the US dollar versus INR depreciation. So when rupee is at 76 and let's say, you know, you are importing oil barrel for let's say $1, you are paying 76 rupees. Again, 76 rupees, today you are paying 82 rupees. So again, there is not just the oil price increase that you are suffering, you are also suffering because of the rupee depreciation, which is a double whammy for India, which is a double benefit for US, is a double whammy for India. So you have higher oil cost, higher rupee uh, depreciation related uh, cost, and ultimately what's happening to the consumers, let's look at it this way. As I said, about 32, 33 crores of people are indebted. Now, this is, the, this is the section which actually has a reduction in its disposable income because of the interest rate rise. But overall, the impact that they would create on the consumption is not really visible. Third part I would like to look at for uh, India is that the constitution of the CPI. Now, typically, it's fruits, vegetables, uh, your wheat, sugar, etc., uh, pulses, milk, etc. Now, nobody is going to start eating less number of chapatis or you know lesser amount of rice just because the price has gone up by let's say 20 rupees or 30 rupees. There are multiple other avenues where you would like to save but not compromise on your the food. So you have an inelastic demand again when it comes to food. As far as fruits are concerned, uh, typically at least in the last three, four months, uh, this is the season of festivals, the religious festivals, whether it is Eid or, you know, the Jain Paryushan or, you know, Ganpati, etc., where people do observe fast and therefore the demand for fruit is substantially high. Given, you know, we, we did suffer a lot at the monsoon and you know the untimely monsoon and there was an issue with the supply of fruits but what i'm point i'm trying to make is that you have by and large an inelastic demand 
for most of the items that constitute CPI. So you have supply side issue, which is where you cannot increase the supply of fruits or pulses or wheat or rice in the short term. At the same time, you have an inelastic demand even for oil. Therefore, by increasing the interest rates, you are not going to be able to kill the demand. What you are actually doing is that you are increasing the cost of your imports and therefore the subsequent its effect, the cascading effect you are creating into manufacturing, transportation and everything else that goes with it. You know, we are heavily dependent on engineering. We are heavily dependent on, let's say, railway technology, metros, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a huge amount of uh, uh, cascading effect that one is creating with rupee depreciation and increase in the cost of manufacturing because of the interest rates. And this is where we are beginning to feel a pinch on our GDP, where the manufacturing, especially the eight core industries, uh, if I look at the data from May, except for one industry, all these seven industries are showing a negative growth month on month. Every single month, the growth rate is lower than the preceding month. And some of them have now gone into a negative. So overall, the point is that India should look at both the parts, which is inflation, as well as the GDP balance and interest rate increase is not the only solution. And you know, I would request Ajay to take over from here and then we could discuss as to you know, what could be the potential ways in which RBI should look at the different methods of controlling inflation. Thank you. Thanks, Adil. Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Atul. Atul has given a, a very uh, good uh, backdrop on uh, inflation, how to look at it, how to look at the different kinds of inflation. And in a broad brush sense, the US inflation uh, is a combination of the supply chain issues coming from the COVID, uh, second uh, being the Ukraine uh, war uh, leading to commodity prices increasing, especially oil. And the third being the amount of stimulus that went into the US market, uh, both uh, starting from 2008 onwards and which got accelerated in 2020 in the backdrop of the COVID lockdowns. Just to give you an idea of the central bank balance sheet expansion, in 2007, the US Fed's balance sheet was about 900,000, uh, 900 billion dollars. And today it is sitting at nearly $9 trillion. So there's been a 10 times expansion in the amount of money uh, that has got printed in the US uh, over the last 14 years. That is the big cause behind everything is a bubble that we are seeing uh, till about 2021. And now uh, all those excesses are coming home to roost. Inflation is uh, the leading uh, uh, consequence of this expansion of money supply, uh, but there are deeper second order effects coming our way. And uh, so the US is more supply chain as well as excess demand. Europe has not seen underlying inflation uh, that strong. It's been more because of energy and food. Uh, today's uh, UK inflation, again, coming in at that, uh, double digits, is more uh, because of the energy expansion, again, because of the Russian sanctions. So Europeans could have managed. The demand is not there in Europe because their stimulus was more about saving the jobs rather than uh, just putting money in people's uh, pockets. What the US did is uh, printing money and sending checks to people. And a lot of it was just used either for buying uh, stocks and trading uh, in a gamification of uh, stock investing, or it was used for consumption. Uh, so the US household balance sheet really ballooned up uh, again, there are 13 to 15 percent of the U.S. population which doesn't have money to eat, who are on food stamps, who are in abject poverty. Uh, but the large portion of Americans benefited from this huge stimulus. That did not happen in the constrained uh, European economies to that extent. They focused on saving uh, the businesses. So the European inflation is different in color. And as Atul mentioned, uh, the emerging markets are twofold. One is the commodity suppliers, say like uh, Brazil, uh, who have uh, benefited uh, from uh, the commodity prices going up, but they have seen uh, a double whammy coming home to roost 
with inflation going up. So Brazil was the first central bank uh, to start raising rates early in 2021 itself. They started raising rates because their inflation was in the high uh, teens, uh, 17 to 19 percent. Uh, then there are the commodity consumers, which is the most of the emerging markets and India stands at the head of it. For us, the inflation is largely imported and the rupee depreciation hits us even more because it brings in imported inflation about which the government can do very little. It uh, destroys our current account balance. Uh, it destroys our uh, balance of payment as well. Uh, the benefit might be very marginal to the exporters, but uh, it hits all our imports. Uh, so uh, depreciation might have worked in 1991, it was a given, uh, and uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh took the decision uh, to save the national economy. Uh, we were probably at a Pakistan today or a Sri Lanka today in 91, but today we are very much stronger and uh, we need to rethink. You know, I used to work for uh, Tibasek, the Singapore government uh, sovereign fund. And as early as 1965, Lee Kuan Yew decided that uh, let's start investing around the world and generate uh, money for the country. The Norwegian pension fund has done that. They keep uh, oil prices very high and uh, put the savings into the Norwegian sovereign fund. And that has grown to more than $1.3 trillion. For a country of 4 million population, imagine how much money is backing every single inhabitant. So I have always been saying that we have too much of foreign reserves we don't need so much foreign reserves. And this time around also the $110 billion reduction, out of that 30, 40 billion has gone towards safeguarding the rupee or trying to do a controlled uh, explosion in the level of the rupee. Most of it is uh, the valuation losses because of the dollar appreciation by nearly 17, 18% overall. And uh, very strongly against the yen of more than 27%, against the sterling. So most of our reserves, the RBI doesn't give the data, but uh, seeing the trade basket, we estimate 59, 60% of our reserves are in the US. Uh, a large portion is in the Euro. And you know, guess what? A poor country like India was lending to the US at 0%, was lending to Europe at negative uh, rates, or is lending to Japan at uh, near to negative returns. Uh, so just see the irony in that. It's not a single logic that you can give. I agree with my economist friends. Uh, you know, uh, they always argue when I say that you don't need such high FX reserves if you're a strong country. Uh, we should rather go for bilateral trade and uh, try and establish more uh, trade uh, patterns where our currency gets expected. It is in a realistic sense, uh, in most of UAE, in uh, Singapore, you go to Mohammed Mustafa, you can convert any amount of rupees. Now they've started taking down your passport details earlier. That was also not there. So we are convertible in some portions of the world, but we need to be convertible more. Being uh, such a large economy and being uh, an economy which has stood by the rule of law, which has always uh, gone and uh, met its obligations. So... First part is the complexion of the inflation is different. Second part, I would say the central bankers' models have broken down. Their forecasting models are not working. Uh, there is talk that Phillips curve no longer works. I uh, did some calculations recently. I published uh, my research also. Uh, the US uh, unemployment needs to come to 6.3% as per the Phillips curve if you want to bring inflation to 2%. This is science, it's econometrics, it's not any made up numbers. And to think that at 4.4% of uh, unemployment next year, the US will have a 2% inflation, uh, I think we are fooling ourselves. Uh, there has to be major economic misery unleashed, hardship in, uh, unleashed if you want a 2% inflation, better would be to take a five-year target that we will live with 4% for uh, three years, then slowly we will bring it down, then to do a crash landing. Because crash landing, as we saw in 2008, 
it will reverberate across the world and India will also suffer. So uh, second part is this, the economic models of the central banks have not worked. Third, that led to them underestimating the inflation potential of the fiscal and monetary stimulus. You can't print so much money globally. The top uh, five central banks balance sheets went up from about uh, $2 trillion in 2007 to $32 trillion. That's the kind of growth that happened. And uh, you know that kind of money sloshing around, the growth in the global GDP is uh, barely 2%. But if all of a sudden you ratchet up money supply, quantitative theory of money will tell you what's going to happen. And uh, this inflation came in. Uh, so that's the third part that inflation uh, estimates of central banks went wrong. Fourth part is now they have really brought out their claws. They have all turned into hawks. The pigeons have been uh, dismissed. The doves have been dismissed. And they're saying, let's not repeat the mistakes of the 1970s. If you see 1970, it was a very different world. OPEC was just emerging. Oil prices shot up. But what did oil prices shoot up to $10? So uh, it was a different world. And Volcker brought in a Volcker shock in 1980 where he raised US rates to 20%. Inconceivable. Jimmy Carter lost the elections because of that. Two to three years of recession came into the US. But post that Volcker shock, we got this great moderation, 40 years of low rates, low inflation, and steady growth. So he brought stability. Now, all these uh, uh, central bankers want to be a Volcker. I don't know if the Volcker solution is the right thing. And that is the fifth point. I agree with Atul. India should be plowing its own independent path as the Japanese are doing, as the Chinese are doing, and not the IMF and World Bank determined path. Uh, we owe it uh, to the large mass of our population, which is very poor, uh, the, you know, with this uh, uh, Garib Kalyan Yojana and the uh, uh, food subsidies that the government has increased, part of it we are addressing, but a large portion will need to be addressed. Sixth part, where we are in trouble, uh, the classic thing we need to have is uh, now stop raising rates uh, and wait for that six to nine months of transmission mechanism to really work through the economy, already we are seeing pressure points emerging. Good thing is we have gone into this uh, cycle with very low leverage on the corporate sector. Households in India were never leveraged and the growth is largely in the mortgage uh, place. So there you are well uh, securitized as far as the lenders go. You have a house backing those loans. But the big part is uh, how much tightening and where is the neutral rate? Uh, you're probably uh, much higher than that already. And uh, what is the complexion of the inflation? It's imported. Uh, demand destruction in a poor country like India will have much worse consequences than the US where safety nets are there. And lastly, because 2024 is national elections, uh, in a year where we should be seeing fiscal austerity, I don't expect that. Uh, be it the state or the central governments, we are at 10% fiscal deficit. If you add the two, we'll probably cross that again next year in the budget. And there will be more welfare oriented and the rabidi culture. All those will get embedded uh, next year. So that will be inflationary. Maybe RBI is looking at that. But I would say uh, the bigger uh, challenge is growth, as Atul has already said. We should focus on growth. Uh, we are okay with inflation. We have managed it well. 7% uh, print will go down to 5% by March, and then the base effect will also help us. Uh, fiscal uh, uh, balancing will not come in until the 2025 budget uh, in a very realistic sense. 2024, you won't have any time, given May will be the election. So no politician will be foolhardy in uh, bringing any uh, you know, well thought out uh, measures, uh, which are long term, it will be all short term, short term welfare measures and freebies that will come in in 2023 and 24 budgets. Uh, so uh, we are going to face an issue on that side. The better part is import substitution, uh, export uh, uh, measures, export, uh, uh, you know, preferences, uh, the opportunity 
of China plus one. We missed a lot of that opportunity. I think a lot of that needs to be looked at very closely. Vietnam, Bangladesh kind of countries did a better job, but they are smaller economies. Uh, our task is bigger. So that way, I would not be critical of the government, but I would say now that we know this and uh, China one, we understand better, do China plus one better and Euro plus one is coming in. Because when the energy prices have gone up nine times, manufacturing in Euro, uh, European country is getting hugely uh, detrimental, very difficult to run, especially in the MSME segments. They are getting wiped out with the energy costs shooting up so much. Germany, for example, set up uh, a committee of industrialists to look at how much uh, subsidy uh, they should give. And they came out for December itself, it will be a 70, 75 billion euro subsidy just for power uh, for the industry to run. Uh, so you can imagine it, it, it might become a 1 trillion uh, euro uh, kind of an expenditure just to make its industry run. That's not going to happen. That money is not there with anybody. And if you print more notes, you will uh, destroy the economies eventually on a three to five year basis. Second order effects of inflation will come in. Uh, so it's a difficult world. India has the opportunity. I would say raising rates more and more will make you very uncompetitive against the Chinese, against all other emerging market countries. You have to look at uh, it in a balanced way and uh, balance out the interest rate hikes with the growth. Over to you, Atul. You're on mute, Atul. You've given such a splendid view, uh, going back all the ways to 1970s. Just uh, picking up your point on the interest rate increase. Um, again, one of the things which why the interest rates are increased is to maintain or ensure that you don't really depreciate on the currency front. So while you are managing the inflation, uh, you are staving off a rundown on your currency. Uh, now, this is one of the things which has worked. As you said, Japan did not actually increase uh, its interest rates despite inflationary pressures. So they have taken a very different path and they have seen a beating up of their currency. Whereas China has actually reduced the interest rates and they've also seen a little bit of beating of their own currency. But Chinese model is slightly different. I'll come to that in a while, but just on the interest rate increase and you know the currency piece, uh, Let's look at India and you know, the whole conversation right now going on is about the FPIs pulling the money and therefore it is difficult for RBI to protect uh, the rupee level. Uh, I just did a little bit of number crunching and I would just uh, read out those numbers. Uh, 2008 and nine, which was the, the so-called global financial crisis, the net outflow by the FPIs out of India was 46,000 pro rupees. But the market capitalization at that point in time was 27 lakh crores, which is about, let's say, 1.75% of the market cap was kind of pulled out by the FPIs. If I look at 21-22, we had an outflow of 1,22,000 crores by the FPIs. Okay? And the market cap was 2,43 lakh crores, which is less than a percent. In fact, less than half a percent. Now, if I look at where was the rupee, rupee remained static between 74 and 76 half throughout 21, 22. We did not increase the interest rates. We did not do anything. RBI did not make a noise. 1,22,000 crores was pulled out of the Indian markets between 21, 22 and no impact or marginal impact on the rupee. This year, so far, they have pulled out about 64,000 crores, which let's say by and large is 50% of the last year. So last year's trend continues, but rupee has already depreciated almost 8%. So that argument that, you know, because FPIs are pulling, uh, pulling out uh, the, the money, uh, the rupee is depreciating is not substantiated by the amount that is put into relevance. And this is where something is missing. I feel that a lot of talk down 
of India happens, especially at the hands of its leaders. You, know, you typically see Indian leaders wanting to compare itself with Sri Lanka. I mean, give me a break. Of all the people, Sri Lanka, I mean, the FM had to go on record to say that, you know, our condition is not the same as Sri Lanka and we are stronger than Sri Lanka. I mean, where is the self-respect, so to speak, that should Indian analysts or economists or the thought leaders should even be mentioning Sri Lanka? And this is where you are creating a psychologically a negative factor. And we have seen this time and again that, you know, typically our political leaders like to pull down our PSU banks. Now, the best of the brains, we all know, I'm from banking sector, we know best of the brains in banking come not from private sector, but they come from PSU banks. So why, and again, once you pull down the PSU banking sector, you play it down. There, another thing that happens is that people start saying, oh, there is a lot more hidden in terms of NPS. And again, that has an impact. Let me pull out the money because you know the government will have to give capital, fiscal will widen, let me pull out of the country. So there are these smaller things, minute things, but they do have an impact on the overall exchange rate. And in India, the exchange rate, since you know, Ajay, Ajay is also very clear that it is an imported inflation. While we are talking about inflation and interest rate, it is very, very important for us to understand how the currency moves. Talking about you know, the, the aspect of exports, I like the China model. If you look at the Chinese model, the Chinese do not have a free float currency. They have a fixed exchange rate. They decide this is the exchange rate, period. And that's what gets uh, done and executed in the market. Back in 1980s, they adopted this. And with that, the exporters of China were forced that you know, if I continue to export what I'm exporting over a period of time, I'm gonna get out of the global market, the global trade. I need to innovate. I need to do value addition. Now in India, the exporters have a real peaceful life because you know every time there's a cost push pressure or inflationary pressure or imported inflation pressure, rupee immediately depreciates. So whatever is, let's say the loss in margin is made good by a higher realization of the dollar. So there is no need or there is no pressure to innovate in export space. So we are still, let's say primary, we are still exporting cotton, cotton yarn, iron ore, et cetera. We have not, not gone in a very big way into the value added exports. And that's where again, the, the inflation, the currency exchange rates, they do come into the play that over a period of time, you really need to look at it as a holistic, measure rather than just following the US theories that you know increase the interest rates, inflation will come down, dollar appreciates. So all the imports that the US does comes cheaper. One of the reasons which is directly linked to the inflation co coming off is that as the dollar appreciates, they need to spend much lesser number of dollars to import the stuff. In India, it's the reverse. We pay much more than what we were paying earlier. So. This is where I think India needs to make a distinction. Again, look at currency as a part of the interest rate to tackle inflation. And maybe, maybe the 2% to 6% range of uh, inflation, which was set up in 2016, 17, or somewhere thereabouts by Dr. Rajan, are we really there? Are we that in advanced country that you know we could look at a 2% to 6% in times like this? There needs to be a rethinking that we really need to relook at the band. A 4% inflation rate as the target rate with 2% plus or minus, I think it's very, very tight. We, are, we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the supply chain. We don't have the stability. And obviously, if these things are not put together, uh, we would end up taking decisions which may control, may. Again, I'm saying, I don't say with today's MSP rise, I think inflation is going to go up, especially on the food. So. It may come under control, but certainly and most definitely you would end up hurting the GDP. And that's something which is not a very welcome step for a country of 130 billion people, 1.3 billion people. We are not US. It's a small country of a smaller population with larger resources. Comparatively, we are a smaller country, 
larger population and limited resources. We can't afford a slowdown. Uh, just to put it in perspective, we may be talking about, you know, 7%, et cetera, in terms of GDP growth. I think this is all because of the base effect. If you actually look at what's my real, real GDP, right, sustainable GDP, you must look at Q1 23-24, that is April, June 2023 as the GDP forecast number, and that's 4%. Yes, it's 4%. We are back to 2003, 2004. This 7% is because of the base effect of the last year, COVID related, et cetera. The real GDP number, the real GDP growth rate is 4%. We can't afford a slide down from there. So again, the RBI needs to relook at the band that it has talked about. Uh, it needs to look at how to protect the rupee, including a moral suasion, like not talking down the rupee compared to Sri Lanka, run down the PSU banks, et cetera, et cetera, and talk about the inefficiencies and take a very different picture, very different measures than what the textbook of the US, written in the US uh, say. Uh, I, I would like to conclude by saying, you know, back in 90s, um, uh, you know, there was this whole thing about, you know, human body is not conducive, is not made up uh, to drink cow's milk. So I know a lot of friends a lot of people stopped drinking milk. Now, here is the thing. The milk that they talked about was different. The milk that they talked about was from the Jersey cows yes. and not from the Indian cows, right? So milk is milk, but milk of Jersey cow versus Indian cow is a whole different. I took just basically one stand that if my rishis, my rishi munis were drinking milk as per our textbooks and they survived for 100 years, why the hell would I not drink it? I rather go by what is mine, what is Indian, than to look at and rely on research of an American saying that the cow milk, uh, cow milk is not good for human body. And this is exactly the same about inflation. My inflation is Indian cow's milk and not Jersey cow's milk. Over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think we can open for questions now. We have covered the entire gamut. Uh, so, uh, if uh, you know there is one question, I'll read it out, uh, Atul. Uh, Shaheen uh, Bachcha is asking: Would purchase of oil in rupee, or say currency of the Saudi Arabia, reduce cost of oil? Yes, it would. We did have an arrangement with Iran, where Iran had deposited a very large amount of money with uh, Yuko Bank, and this settlement was happening uh, between Iran and India in rupee. And that definitely is the way to go. Why should we go via the dollar? And that is something which I think is the beginning. We really need to be bold. We really need to be self-centric and assertive that this is how I'm going to purchase oil. It's a very good thing. I'm happy that RBI and the government is thinking about it. It's a question of execution. We should definitely do it. It's very, very positive. Absolutely. And, you know, I would say uh, it's a question of having a clearing mechanism in place. We should, uh, we used to have the Asian Clearing Union uh, when I was, uh, I started banking. And then, uh, you know, we had to uh, let go of it because of the Iranian sanctions and stuff. But today, if you see China is uh, on a daily basis picking up Iranian oil. In fact, uh, recently there was this uh, report that Malaysia custom uh, exports of oil was more than the production of oil in Malaysia. So uh, Iranian oil was coming into Malaysia, getting papers as being Malaysian oil and being shipped to China, apart from the open seas transfer that they are doing uh, ship to ship uh, in the Indian Ocean. Same with the Russian oil, after all this noise that was made on India, now the reports are coming out that uh, since February uh, till uh, September, entire Europe bought about $100 billion worth of Russian oil and gas, $100 billion. India was buying a small portion of that, and we were hauled on coals, uh, despite you know Russia being a time-tested friend of India. So I think the nuanced uh, look and as well as the non-aligned, uh, very strident uh, policy that the government of India followed, that was a good welcome change of following the national interest rather than uh, just going blindly 
into a camp of uh, people you can't depend on who go and uh, all of a sudden who all of a sudden put for 50 uh, for 50 million dollars of f16 uh, to pakistanis those will never be used for uh, anti terrorism they are used for delivery of nuclear weapons so it's the nuclear deterrence of pakistan that you are helping and uh, all of a sudden you bring that in uh, so uh, i would say the more the better especially say with russians we should have a barter economy uh, we are sending out a lot of consumer goods to them same way uh, you know if we can have a, a decent clearing mechanism and a settlement happens once a month uh, with the exim bank standing guarantee i think it can give a lot of impetus to this kind of trade uh, and uh, maybe uh, 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 there are two three more questions let me see atul if i can uh, given russian crude is cheap can we shift the purchase to russia and curtail our dollar exposure and uh, second question is do you see inflation peaking in india and the same with interest rates in the next few months so yeah russia definitely yes we are already doing it yes. i think we are already doing it so it's not a question of starting it we are already doing it uh, yes the inflation would peak but i guess uh, you know given the msp that has come in as a little bit of a surprise uh i think it would be delayed the peaking of uh, this would be delayed till until about february or march uh once you have the figures of rabi crop coming in uh if i was to look at the monsoon uh you know i like to look at the the clouds coming in from the southwest as we have been told but this time you will be surprised the whole monsoon we did not get by and large we did not get southwest monsoon we got westerly winds and westerly monsoon even now if you see the wind directions are such difficult uh, to predict and completely off the track they should be going over chennai they are coming to mumbai uh, so you if you look at the wind directions i don't expect monsoon to go away completely uh, in different parts of the country we would continue to have rains clear havoc on agriculture so combine these two msp plus unpredictable monsoons which to my mind will continue for a good time going all the way up to march april um, between let's say the western coast and the north the northern part of india uh, one very important aspect is uh, there was a study by the pune meteorological society that the surface temperature of uh, the arabian sea has gone up by 2 degree centigrade which means we would be more often visited by cyclones especially in the border areas especially Uh, maharashtra gujarat and the delhi haryana punjab so obviously these three things put together peak out february somewhere there abouts and obviously the rates uh, rbi may take a little uh, let's say uh, conservative uh, stance for now but sooner or later they'll have to read into the gdp numbers yeah i i, I totally endorse uh, atul's views uh next question is are we looking at a long term slowdown in the us how will the inflation affect other sectors like education in the us from a career standpoint is the current bout of inflation and external events a correct factor to base long term career in india or other asian countries versus the us as you want to take that <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I think India is the place to be. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, we are doing very well. You want to go out and uh, get an education, American education, most welcome. Just look at it this way. You know, the amount of subsidies India is giving to the US, eighty-two thousand students got a student visa. You and I, if we go today, we are getting a two-year uh, uh, appointment uh, for a visa, but students were uh, fast tracked. Uh, so 82000 uh, students uh, roughly uh, they would be uh, spending anything uh, from 50 to 70000 dollars per year for the next 3 to 4 years that's the huge amount of money that uh, indians are really splurging on the us education uh, and then you add on canada uh, australia uk bit of europe we had uh, indian medical students caught up in ukraine for example so we are supplying a lot and that again you know uh, with the new education policy government is starting 
but you know the bureaucracy has such a strong control on everything i'm uh, associated uh, with uh, some uh, medical colleges getting the approvals is such a long term process long drawn out i would be doubling medical seats at all the aims uh, you know why uh, you should have at my time when i uh, got out of school there were 35 seats in aims new delhi and that was the uh, best uh, you could get and hardly seats are there in india so uh, you know that's a huge uh, uh, way of uh, leakage from india needs to be uh, looked at uh, government is looking but the bureaucracy is very entrenched and the uh, state level uh, there is very little hope so it is a top down thing in terms of building a career i think uh, india is the place to be uh, look at it this way on a purchasing power parity we are probably a 10 trillion dollar economy so the rupee depreciation has hurt us uh, when i started working indian rupee used to be 8 to 10 uh, rupees per dollar and today you are at 82 today we made again a lifetime low on the rupee 82 81 we crossed uh, so we have really lost out my uh, uh, batchmates who just happen to be in the us are 10 times richer if we just earned the same uh, across uh, our lifetimes uh, just by the currency uh, uh, holding steady while our currency kept coming down uh, but india is the growth india is a lot of future i'm not uh, telling that uh, other uh, areas are not there us the size of the opportunity scale of the opportunity uh, is massive uh, so depends sector to sector but i think it's a deglobalizing world it will be a very reshoring world uh, bringing back jobs to each society and outsiders will not be so welcome as they were in the 70s 80s 90s Uh, as the indian software uh, professionals were welcome you will face more of issues so it would be best to plan for a career in india that is my thinking i chose not to go out easiest thing uh, working for city bank everybody wanted to get out in the first two years five years seven years i had multiple options but i chose to stay in india because i thought the growth was here and i have done well uh, on that you know i had jobs in the i remember my uh, ex boss is deceased now mr ashok that was our country head and at that time i had got a 10 times more paying job in saudi to set up the uh, bpo uh, center for hsbc british uh, uh, saudi british bank uh, and i was getting 10 times money tax free and he said uh, you know and then what unless you go and do another mba Uh, but you stay here i'll give you a branch manager job you hire uh, you uh, you know manage unionized staff manage direct customers and see look at the scale of the market and by 40 you will have so much money you will never spend it in your life some uh, grandchild uh, great grandchild will blow it up you will uh, die leaving it to them and that happened really i you know uh, salaries for us atul Uh, went up thousand to five thousand times from what we joined at. Uh, so we were a very lucky generation in that sense. Uh, growing up in India, uh, coming into the workforce in the eighties, and uh, uh, you know, really we benefited from the big bang ninety uh, one. Then the dot com two uh, thousand, uh, the Y two K. I think we were huge beneficiaries, and still we are at uh, a cusp. We have to still, uh, you know, uh, realize this. and what angus madison uh, you know the study uh, there's the oecd professor who passed away a few years back but he uh, put out the global gdp again purchasing power terms uh, from 0 uh, bc 2 to uh, 1700 if you look at that india was uh, the tops with china we were both together contributing 50 55% us is a 200 to 50 year story before that uh, it was not on the economic map at all europe peaks in 1870s and then goes down and has been going down japan has been steady steady uh, africa will emerge but uh, india and china will get back to 25% gdp just because of the demographics and chinese demographics are uh, worsening much faster than ours uh, because of the one child policy for multiple decades uh, this hidden uh lack of population in china already uh, they short some 35 million workers so they will 
be forced to move up the automation chain, uh, we have the opportunity to step in with China plus one, Euro plus one. So I would say India, I would any day bet on India. Oh, there are more questions, uh, more than we can. <laughs> Uh, I will try to summarize now instead of reading. How is the INR ruble exchange rate set? Uh, it's a, uh, uh, Atul, uh, you want to take that uh, INR uh, ruble? I, I am not really certain as to how it is set because that's, that's I think, works in progress. Yeah. It's, it's still not set. Yeah. You have to take it versus the dollar on a daily basis unless you agree to a predetermined rate, which used to happen with the Soviet Union. They used to give us uh, beneficial rates. And, you know, uh, especially in the 71 war, we got submarines and aircraft carrier at throwaway prices. So they used to be quite uh, benign to India. Uh, but now it is more market determined. And uh, that's one of the issues in the clearing mechanism that at what rate will you settle the trade? And if you look at the ruble, it's moved so sharply up and down uh, that uh, it's very difficult to, and the rates also, uh, they, uh, the central bank uh, president of uh, Russia is a very bright lady. On the day of the Ukraine uh, invasion, she hiked the rates to 20%. So she gave a Volcker shock and she held the economy together, but cracks are very much there. So what you see is not there. What would be best is if the Indian government had a debit credit with the Russian central bank, and you could just do a settlement. You are sending tea. Uh, it's, uh, today it is uh, valued at this much dollar in the notional sense. I'm buying that much oil. This is the value. And net, I pay you $5 instead of paying you $500 million. So that kind of uh, offsetting barter trade might be better than trying to determine a ruble rupee with both, uh, you know, moving volatile way. Uh, next is uh, how retail investors should plan their move in given situations, keep a balance between recession and retirement plan in equities. I think that's a whole seminar we have to do. Anything Atul? No, I guess you have to keep moving. The world is changing so fast. You can't have one strategy for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. So remain fixed plus, you know, remain agile on the investments. Even the economy is changing so fast. The old economy shares are going out. You have to keep very agile in terms of investments. And if you're not uh, very up there in terms of uh, uh, agility, knowledge, etc., you have mutual funds to go by. But I'm not an investment expert. Uh, I don't uh, look at equity markets. Never looked at it in my lifetime. So, uh, yeah. But I, I guess I, these are the questions. Um, Ajay, more to do with, let's say, the yeah. exchange rates. Um, we yeah. kind of already passed uh, one hour plus. Uh, so, okay. Noshad, over to you. 